the Gibbs Business School, uh, colleagues, the executives and the professors there. Um, and of course, in the academic world, allow me to welcome you all, including our Vice Chancellor, Professor Tawana Kupe. Um, and of course, our special guests this evening include friends and honored guests, colleagues of Professor Whitaker, but especially um, the Whitaker family, as well as the Moffat family. I've had the privilege of meeting uh, Mr. Moffat, and so I, I, I welcome you back, and I'm happy to see you. And I now know the rest of the family because I've seen pictures of Louise and her family on her WhatsApp profile. I'm the WhatsApp stalker. Um, <laughs> colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to remind you that an inaugural lecture represents one of the most important milestones in the career of an academic, as it provides the professor presenting, or more specifically, the professor professing uh, the opportunity uh, to inform the university and the broader university community about her academic journey and specifically about her research to date as well as the direction she wishes to steer her research into the future. Above all, it allows us at Gibbs an opportunity to showcase and celebrate the academic achievements of the professing professor. Uh, colleagues and ladies and gentlemen, the order of events is that I will introduce our vice chancellor, who in turn will introduce uh, the professing professor. So who is uh, Professor Coupe? For those of you that don't know, he is the vice chancellor and principal of the University of Pretoria and has been in this role since 2019. He holds a DPhil in media studies from the University of Oslo, Norway, which might explain why we always start on time when he's, events, when he's in charge of events. Um, in December 2019, he received an honorary doctorate from Michigan State University. He did resist, ladies and gentlemen, because he says, I'm not yet retired. Why are you honoring me yet? Um, but he, the, the French were not impressed with the Americans offering him an honorary doctorate. So the University of Montpellier in October 2021 offered him um, also an honorary doctorate. What is not reflected here, and just to embarrass him, uh, he also has one of the highest orders given by the French to a non-French citizen. Uh, this was awarded to him uh, as the Knight of the French National Legion by President of the French Republic. President uh, Macron. Uh, he did this for his remarkable achievement in promoting scientific and academic cooperation. Um, particularly, the French were very impressed with the work that he does globally in this regard. He is the founder of the African Centers for the Study of the US, both at the University of Pretoria and in his previous home, the University of the Witwatersrand. Professor Coupe is an active member of several civil society organizations, including Ama Bungani, um, and is a board member of a number of tertiary education networks and organizations locally and globally. Ladies and gentlemen, I now hand you over to our Vice Chancellor and Principal, uh, Professor Coupe, to introduce um, Professor Louise Whitaker. Over to you, Professor. Thank you, Professor Mtombeni. Dean of the Gordon Institute of Business Science. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's a very exciting day when we, I, I think you got it slightly wrong, uh, Professor Mtomen. It's called the inaugurating professor. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I like your version uh, better than mine. So it's an exciting day, for, for, of course, for the inaugurating professor and their friends, colleagues, and associates. I'm here really not to spend too much time with uh, Maurice went way too much about me. Today is not about me. It's about Professor Louise Whitaker. So here I'm going to talk about Professor Louise Whitaker. She's an expert on strategy, governance, and ethics, particularly in relation to organizations and information systems. Governance cannot be meaningful without ethics. 
and both are essential to successful strategies and, proje and projects. She also has an extensive experience and interest in qualitative and phenomenological research. I hope you can spell that word. Prof. Whitaker he has supervised nine graduated PhDs and over 120 master's dissertations, many of them in these areas. Yeah, you want to clear PhD yes, too? Yes. She also conducted the own published research and strategy consultancy work. She was an associate, then a senior editor for the Information Systems Journal, a major international journal from 2009 to 2020. Professor Whitaker directed a highly qualified professional team of administrators in the delivery of the Gibbs Academic Program, comprising postgraduate diplomas, masters, and doctoral degrees from 2017 to 2022. She's currently the Deputy Dean and Executive Director for Faculty. She's an extensive experience with curriculum design and international accreditation processes for business schools and is also active in the United Nations Principles for Responsible Management Education Organization. Today, ladies and gentlemen, Professor Whitaker, the inaugurating professor, as we often say, what does the professor profess? She's going to be professing on the ethical imperative for scholarship of inclusion in management studies. Ladies and gentlemen, the inaugurating professor, and a great team, Professor, your audience tonight. Good evening. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay, never quite sure with the mic and the distance. Um, it's wonderful to see you all this evening. Good evening, Vice Chancellor, Professor Coupe, Dean Morrison from Benny, colleagues. Thank you for being here tonight. Um, family, friends, it's, it's a privilege to have you. Thank you for the opportunity to address you this evening and for being here for attending this inaugural lecture, whether you are in person or online. I can't see the online faces. Um, I'm hoping that the right ones are there. If they're not, they're gonna be in trouble with me. That's my children. Um, but we will find out in due course, I guess. As was mentioned by Prof. Coupe, um, an inaugural lecture is given by a newly appointed full professor on the occasion of their appointment. What he didn't mention is that in order to be appointed as a professor, one has to go through um, what I would politely describe as daunting and perhaps more honestly describe as entirely terrifying um, process of appointment. And in the context of the UP, the University of Pretoria, being a research intensive university, in the process of that appointment, one has to explain one's research and one's research identity. Um, as, as you said, professors, one has to be able to answer this very question. What is it, professor, that you profess? So in this lecture tonight, this inaugural lecture, um, I aim to answer that question, what do I profess to profess? Um, and not only to say something about the what, but to say something about the why. Why do I do what I do in my research? This is a little bit unusual. I think why is not always the question that is answered here. So I, let me explain why I want to do it before I do. I really believe that as human beings, we have to question. We cannot profess to understand something until we have questioned it. And in the process of questioning it, we have to understand the moral underpinnings of our thought processes as well as our actions. We are obliged to understand why we do what we do. The question of why is the critical one. Not only why do I do what I do, but is it what I ought to do? Some moral philosophers will suggest that this only applies to the big questions, the very big ones, the difficult ones that get set in moral philosophy lectures. But if one isn't applying this question of, am I doing what I ought to do all the time, how do we know that we are doing the right thing? So it is for this reason, and I hope the clicker works, <laughs> that this lecture is entitled, The Ethical Imperative for a Scholarship of Inclusion in Management Studies, or the brief version, 
why I research what I do. The research that I have conducted in the last 25 years, and it's a little hard to believe that it is 25, but there you are, it is, is located in the field of critical management studies. This is defined as the grouping of theoretically innovative approaches to management, business, and organization that encompasses a wide range of perspectives that are critical of traditional theories of management, as well as established social practices and institutional arrangements. In information systems, critical research focuses on social issues such as freedom, power, social control, and values. There is an entire body of research in critical management studies, and indeed, particularly in information systems research. But I have come to realize that a potential failing of CMS, as it's known, and indeed, possibly of critical research in general, is that it is all too easy to criticize. It is too easy to deconstruct and much harder to construct. In other words, when critical approaches are not constructive, they may, by their very nature, be destructive and lead to a sort of pervasive cynicism and a what can we do about any of this anyway approach to thinking about things. This has forced me to consider how I might take a more constructive and creative approach and indeed, why I would want to do so. In other words, the question is this, what is all this criticism for? Why are we critical and what are we trying to achieve? Or, coming back to it, why do I research what I do? Now, when we ask this question as scholars of management, we often start with the concept of a paradigm. A paradigm is really the basic understanding of a body of work that tells us what the worthy objects of study are, as well as how they should be studied. It's foundational across many, many disciplines in the sciences. It was first expressed by um, Kuhn, who, who spoke about paradigms of scientific study. In organizational studies, one of the most well-known, probably foundational frameworks of sociological paradigms is that which is developed by Burrell and Morgan. Not going to give you a very detailed explanation of Burrell and Morgan's sociological paradigm here, I promise. We won't go into the detail of, of everything that they had to say. Um, but I think that what's important to understand is that this framework distinguishes research according to underpinning assumptions. And those underpinning assumptions are about ontology, which is the nature of reality, and epistemology, which is how we should study this reality. Of course, you'll notice that there's a two-by-two two framework on the board here. Um, I just want to point out to my management school colleagues that I have thereby fulfilled all the requirements of a lecture in management because we have a basic requirement for a two-by-two two framework in any course that we teach. It's absolutely critical. Tracy, when we get to the curriculum committee, you can give me a tick on that particular one. For the purpose of this lecture, I want to focus on the horizontal axis here, axis. And this horizontal axis is that of an understanding of the nature of reality and knowledge. What is reality and how best can we know about it? You'll see that on the, on the framework, the continuum here runs from subjective to objective. So the objective position says, reality is entirely external to me. Social reality, remember this is a sociological paradigm. Sociological reality is entirely external to me and I can understand it objectively. From the point of view of how I know, most often that means some form of measurement because that's the best way to understand something objectively. On the other side of that continuum, you will see a, sub a subjective position. The subjective position says reality is only what I perceive it to be. At its most extreme, it's pro probably really quite solipsis solipsistic. Never try and say that in a lecture again. <laughs> but a good example about how to think about this is to think of the movie The Matrix. I'm very aware that I'm giving my age away here and that um, the younger people who are hopefully online um, might not know about this one. But in the movie The Matrix, 
Neo, who's the hero up there on the screen, thinks that he is living in a real world. He works in computers, he goes to work every day, he works in an office, he lives in an apartment. But then, Neo swallows the red pill. And he discovers that everything he thought was real was simply being fed via a tube directly into his brain from a vast computer. His reality is completely subjective. So here are the opposite ends of the spectrum. A purely objective world in which everything is external and can be measured independently of the measurer, or an entirely assumed, possibly even simulated world. These extremes are not very useful positions in and of themselves. What we can quickly see is that some things probably are quite subjective because people perceive things in different ways. On the other hand, other things, even in the social world, are necessarily quite objective. For example, either I'm a professor at Gibbs or I'm not. So then, what do we do? Do we take a position somewhere in the middle? Or do we do something else with this continuum? In the late 19th and early 20th centuries, a number of European sociologists and philosophers took a different approach. They argued that if we want to understand, in particular, social phenomena, we need to perceive understanding as a circle. This circle is called the hermeneutic circle. It's named for Hermes, the Greek messenger of the gods. Hermes was also a thief and a terrible liar, so I don't know what that says about sociologists in the late 19th century, but there you have it. What the concept of the circle tells us is this. In order to understand something, we have to have some context for that understanding, some pre-understanding. We can refer to that as the whole. Within that whole, the particulars make sense and they in turn inform the whole, the context. In this way, my contextual understanding expands. Habermas calls this the horizon of meaning. Let me give you an example. I ask you, is there water in the fridge? Let's say we are sitting at a family lunch. Your answer, is going to depend on whether or not there is a bottle of water in the fridge. You understood the particular, my query, based on the context. We're at lunch. I must be thirsty and asking for some water to drink. Now, putting all of that aside, let's say I say to you, is there water in the fridge? But actually, I am a fridge repairman. Your answer is going to depend on whether something in the fridge is leaking and water is collecting at the bottom of the fridge. The context informs the particular. Either way, the particular will also inform the whole. Louise is thirsty, let's fetch the water. Or the fridge is indeed leaking, let's fix it. So now, the dualism between subjective and objective ontologies and epistemologies is disrupted. It's not an either or on endpoints of a continuum. The endpoints meet each other in the circle. When we think about what things are, as well as how to understand them, the particular and our ability to understand it at all depends on the whole. With no context, there would be no way to answer the question, is there water in the fridge? The whole and the particular for human beings are expressed mostly in language. Water, fridge, bottle, leak. In European philosophy, this is referred to as the linguistic turn. Understanding that our understanding depends on what we already understand and how we express it. The German phenomenologist Heidegger explored this idea in relation to our very existence 
in his book, Being and Time. Now, Heidegger never really got to the time bit, although the book is like 600 pages long. He ran out of it, time. Um, but he did explore being in great detail. And one of Heidegger's most important concepts is this. If I only ever understand because I already have some context, then the context that I'm in is essential to my very being, my very being in the world. And he expressed it like that. Being is in the world, including the hyphens. They were corrected by the editor, but I had to put them back in because it really is important that it is a singularity. When we are in the world, we understand what we are encountering on a day-to-day -day basis, what to do, how to conduct ourselves. So in, in this sense, is not to be understood categorically as physical inclusion, in a thing in a world, like if you took a rabbit and put it in a hat. That's not what in means here. In is rather understood existentially as an involvement in a world, and that world is a structural whole of meaningful connections. Things make sense together in the world. Let me give you an example of that. I can say, I think, that I am in academe. That means that the world of academia, in fact, what we're doing here right now, forms a meaningful whole in which I can operate. For example, everyone in this auditorium, I hope, has an understanding of a lecture. We all understand that it is my job to stand here and address you. A little bit more formally than we normally do at Gibbs. No wandering around in the front there because I need the notes. But nonetheless, this is a lecture. That's my job. Your job is to pretend to pay rapt attention. And I must say that so far, you're doing a very good job. So thank you, everybody, for that. What none of us is going to do is leap up and dance or sing right now. In another context, a performance context, that would be perfectly appropriate. But if I do suddenly run around the front of the podium and start singing and dancing right now, you'd think I'd lost it and not just a little bit. Simply for this reason, it wouldn't fit in this world. So how does this relate to management studies? Let's consider a hypothetical manager if we think about a hypothetical manager going about her job of managing in an organization, we can see that she is not an autonomous, independent of the whole, self-sufficient source of intelligibility, independent of her environment. Her world isn't out there. It's something in which she always already is. The manager is a manager because she is in the world of the organization. With any luck, she isn't a manager when she isn't in the world of the organization. She might be a different sort of a person then, a friend, a mother, a spouse, a partner. In my experience, if you manage your family as if you were the manager in the world of the organization, that doesn't always necessarily go down too well. But coming back to our manager in this world, we see that when she's in that world, she interprets everything, including herself, in terms of that world of the organization. What happens with a manager is this. She understands not only what she does, but also what entities can show up in the world, mostly without explicitly considering them. So let me give you an example here. She's not encountering mere flesh, a body of a person, to which she then assigns meaning. She does not counter, encounter a human being whom she consciously identifies, categorizes, and then subsequently treats as, for example, a customer. Equally, the manager in this world is not going to encounter something like this, a long cylinder containing ink. She doesn't look at it and say, gosh, there's a long cylinder containing ink. Rather, she directly encounters a pen. 
She directly encounters customers, pens, employees, desks in the world where they are available as such because they fit into the whole. So for example, here, customers show up as customers. And they show up as important because of the manager's concern for them, because she is in an organization where customers matter. The things, processes, or people that show up for her are the things that matter in the context of the space in which she finds herself. And this is where we get to the ethical imperative. Because we have to ask, what makes some things or people matter and not others? What informs the context in which a manager operates? Who gets to step inside the horizon of our understanding? It's useful here to consider Giddens' structuration theory. Now, structuration theory is also a model that has a hole in parts, and in this case, the hole in the parts are structure and action. They are also a dialectic, like the hermeneutic circle. The thing about Giddens is that he points to particular elements that structure action based on the whole. And those elements are meaning, power, and norms. They are things that make sense in a context. That's the meaning. That we believe we should do, that's the norms. And that we are allowed to do, which is the power. And when we act, we always act in terms of these structures because they inform our possibility for action. We then either shift or more often reinforce them. Giddens was particularly interested in the persistence of structural structures in society. And so his theory emphasizes structure as being something that is reinforced. If we had no meaning, powers, or norms, about this event, what would we do when we walked in the room? We'd mill about, not knowing what, what should be going on. But you see, by definition, meaning, power, and norms in the first instance create the context and tell us who gets to step inside the horizon. They create a horizon of possibility. And because they do that, they include and they also exclude. And if they exclude in an unreasonable way, then they are not productive or reasonable. So let's look at some particular examples of this, this some, some concrete examples. Here is an ATM. Well, the keypad of an ATM and the rest of it in the background. I think you'll agree that this looks pretty much like a standard ATM. There is nothing controversial about this, right? But for most people, we actually haven't thought about the norms that lead to this particular design of an ATM. If you approach and interact with a standard text-based, because that's what it is, ATM, it can become obvious that it makes a whole range of assumptions about the person who is using it. That person there with their hand on the keypad. The design of this ATM has assumed that the user is able to approach the ATM at the right height, see the screen, read the content of the screen, insert a banking card, press the buttons, hear the input verification, the signal, the beep, remember a pin, that's the hard part, <laughs> then follow the instructions on the screen, remove a card, cash, receipt, count the cash, make sure that it's correct, and so on. In each of these cases, it's possible to list a number of reasons why that assumption might not hold, or rather, why the assumptions of the designers might disable certain potential users. As early as 1990, research by Van der Hayden showed that between 15 and 20% of the population has a disability that makes it difficult or impossible for them to use a standard ATM. In South Africa, about a third of adults are functionally illiterate. How do they use a text-based ATM? In all of these instances, it's more accurate to say 
that are not in substantial number of people are potentially disabled by a standard ATM because the ATM makes inappropriate assumptions about them. Should we not question the assumption that the norms underpinning the design of this ATM are reasonable? Here is another example. A micro-business owner. Lebo is a micro-business owner. This is a quote from, from Lebo, and it says, I do money. I sell at times a cigarette, and I print t-shirts. I mend shoes. I also sell shoes and hair products like hair extensions, oh, cleaning chemicals, cookies on my mom's, the eggs as well. A bank manager who looks at Lebo might assume that he is a ready-made customer for financial services as a borrower. Given that most often small business owners' lack of access to credit is problematized as a constraint to the growth of their businesses, which it is. Unfortunately, Adverse inclusion, which is lending that then creates a debt trap, is very much a reality. And moreover, the bank manager, who has read this quote, unless they've read it carefully, doesn't understand level at all. Studies such as the PhD research conducted by Grant Kruger under my supervision show that small business owners are often lenders as well as borrowers. Creditors as well as debtors, I do money. The meaning of borrower that is assumed here might not be reasonable. A third example, here is Tembi. Tembi needs to send money home in a cross-border financial transaction. She doesn't want to risk her small bit of money that she has. She doesn't trust the systems that are in place in the formal sector to be fair to her and to her family, not to eat her money. Her status as a migrant worker is fragile, particularly in the current situation, and she has no power to change it. So what's she going to do? She's going to do what she always does, and she's going to turn to Amalacha, a minibus courier, Someone she knows and experiences as reliable, and indeed they are. But those remittance fees are exorbitant. The power structures dictate that Tembi doesn't even really show up as a customer. This is arguably really unreasonable. Nonetheless, in every case here, there are options. Instead of the silent ATM, we can build talking ATMs ones that speak to people who perhaps cannot read or see. Instead of adverse inclusion, banks can understand their clients' needs more individually and provide suitable products. Instead of requiring a bank account, a mobile money organization can provide a technology solution for remittances. The essence of structuration is to see that while action is structured by meaning, power, and norms, it also structures them. Action is enabled by power, not paralyzed by it. And so while she may be powerless, no agent is entirely powerless. There is always a possibility of acting otherwise, of local resistance. For us as researchers, of clearing some small space in the pervasive network of power. It's not enough to stop at deconstructing how the world is. Management practices, business practices, strategic decisions as they ought to be, must also be considered. To the extent that a system of domination excludes, resistance in the context of management studies ought to be directed towards understanding inclusion, bringing the excluded inside the horizon of meaning. Therefore, I conclude, a scholarship of inclusion is an ethical imperative necessitated by the ontological and epistemological nature of what we study. Because of what it is, we ought to research how the excluded can be included. Each of the examples that I gave above is discussed in various research papers. 
This is the part where I get to what Professor Mtumbeni promised, which is to tell you a bit about what I've actually been up to for the past 20 odd years. Inclusion specifically in the context of information technology is discussed in a paper called Power, Cash, and Convenience. I'm going to give some examples of papers along the way here. Translations in the political site of the ATM. In this paper, we conceptualize the ATM as a site where a multiplicity of relationships become configured in ways that serve some interests and not others. Including and excluding particular individuals as a consequence of the assumptions that are made in the design of the ATM. Inclusion in the economy through the use of information technology, hence there are two arrows on the screen there, is discussed in this paper, I hate to take a risk. Building legitimacy in a mobile payments network in the South Africa Zimbabwe remittance corridor. This paper was written with Nick Indebele, a PhD student of mine, and it is a case study grounded in actor network theory. Actor network theory provides a lens for a closer examination and explanation of the collective, dynamic, historical, and social character of mobile money systems. Actor network theory posits that all actors in a network, be they human or non-human, the system, the people, and the technology together, are structured in such a way as to achieve particular outcomes. Again, this is about the assumptions that are underpinning the designs of the systems. In this paper, we are able to foreground the transformational power of digital channels in a setting where cash-based remittances are very deeply entrenched. A very specific kind of inclusion in the economy, namely financial inclusion, is the focus of the paper Turning on the township, which is a lovely metaphor, but it's kind of double meaning there, turning towards it as well as switching it on, financial inclusion in South Africa. And this paper was written with Grant Kruger, who I'm hoping is online from America. In this paper, we use a Foucauldian discourse analysis, which looks at how small business owners conceptualize themselves in respect to financial inclusion. That is then contrasted with how banks and public sector organizations, as well as NGOs, conceptualize dis, um, financial inclusion in how they discuss it, how they talk about it. This is the discourse. What are the discourses of self-determination that are produced by small business owners in respect of financial inclusion? An analysis which compares and contrasts these various discourses demonstrates that texts about financial inclusion from banks, public sector organizations, and NGOs typically establish a boundary of financial inclusion in terms of two elements only, income and ex expense management. In practical terms, what that means is that banks will typically provide loans or transaction accounts. And those are the two primary forms of, of inclusion that are developed by large organizations transactional banking, and loans. What is missing from this is asset building. Asset building is essential to including people in the economy and to have building the possibility for generational wealth. As a consequence of this, asset building is proposed as a field of activity that is not currently considered as part of the mainstream financial inclusion discourse. This raises important questions about the societal impact and relevance of financial inclusion activities and projects. Other studies of inclusion, many of them co-authored with students as well, speak to marginalized actors in the broader economy. For example, domestic workers, in a paper with Jeffrey Dupree, and papers on informal traders, one and two, <laughs> Both in the Natal Spread um, economy, I think that's what both of them are there. I have to be honest with you, I can't read the writing on the back of the screen there. Um, perhaps you can. Derek Schrader and Ian McKay on informal mar market traders and um, David Dickinson and Christine Bieber also informal market traders in the Natal Spread market, just down the road here. Additionally, um, we've done work on mi migrant micro, micro entrepreneurs 
And in the latter paper with Andre van der Walt as part of his MBA studies, we explore why micro-entrepreneurs operate enterprises in uncertain environments, and in particular, how social capital contributes to their opportunity creation, even though their businesses are contextualized in poverty. I'm really pleased to say that following that MBA research, Andre has moved on to become a PhD student here at Gibbs, not under my supervision. I will forgive my colleague who nicked him from me, but he's going to graduate any day now, and we're very proud of that too. A number of papers that I have worked on have explicitly dealt with inclusion in methodological issues, such as the role of narrative in strategy with Dominic Heil, and the role of phenomeno phenomenological hermeneutics. I promise I won't ask anyone to spell that when we finish the lecture. In Truth, Journals, and Politics, the case of the Management Information Systems Quarterly with Lucas Introna, we demonstrate the ways in which regimes of truth at the MIS Quarterly make it possible for certain types of research to be published there and others not, a phenomenon which any of my colleagues in the room will be familiar. This paper argues and demonstrates, I hope, with Foucault, that all institutions already have their politics of truth. And this shows the intimate connection between truth and power. Who gets to say what counts? Who gets to say what is allowed to show up inside the horizon of understanding? This paper questions the often implied legitimacy and status that journals like MIS Quarterly have over and against other journals which may also be of very high quality in any field. I have also published papers that apply phenomenology as a method around reputation, um, corporate strategy, and information systems evaluation. In terms of where this goes from here, um, what might might call studies in progress, certainly an objective of what to do from, from here on out, inclusion remains central to the work in which I am engaged. Inclusion in its information systems and technology. Here I'm currently working on a paper on privacy individual privacy in the digital sphere specifically, as well as papers on digital transformation with Precious Nyanguma and Shafiwa Ramatuga. In respect of micro and small business, in which you'll see I'm very interested as well, I'm working currently on a paper on theorizing from research in extreme context with, with Lisa Hagen. Lisa has done work on how small businesses survive in extreme contexts, and just in time, along came a pandemic. Turns out that it's very difficult to do research under those contexts too, and theorizing from that research becomes even more challenging. I'm also working, along with um, Professor Helena Barnard, with Paulina Mamakoba, who's also working with Lisa, by the way, um, on a very interesting study on urban farming technology, technology broadly conceived here, and the formation of urban farmer identity. This particular study is an application of phenomenology in, whoops, in particular, Paulina is looking at interpretive phenomenological analysis, which she has used, I should say, interpretive phenomenological analysis to study urban farmer identity. I'm also working on a paper on leadership identity appraisal with Sarah Babb, who is similarly using IPA. In conclusion, I would like to say that it has been an immense privilege to do what I do, to do the work that I do, to work with the people I work with, to the, do the research that I have done over what is now essentially a lifetime of working to date. Every single project I work on, every single colleague or student I have the privilege to work with reminds me of why I do what I do. It is because I believe that I ought to, that it is meaningful, and I genuinely believe that the work that we do makes a difference in people's lives. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Whitaker. Um, so let me tell you what's going to happen, then tell you, and then we'll all be at peace. I'll begin by thanking Professor Whitaker for 
her insights in her inaugural lecture on what she has professing. Then I will thank a few people in the room that really made this evening as special as it is. And then <coughs> Professor Whitaker is gonna lead out the procession. So remember to play that wonderful traditional song that we will eventually get rid of <coughs> and, and, and Africanize it. <coughs> um, and she will lead us out. And when she does, I'm gonna ask you once again to be on your feet and then we'll invite you to join us for some snacks afterwards. Um, so beginning with you, Professor Whitaker, thank you for professing about being, where being is in the world, appropriately hyphenated, in such an evocative and memorable manner. For example, we shall ever, forever wonder about how Hermes, the thief, and Neo, Neo, as opposed to how you Africanized the matrix, <laughs> help us to understand the role of meaning, norms, and power in shaping human behavior. Thank you for inviting us through your focused research narrative to be critical as well as self-critical as we lead and manage in an ethical and responsible manner, specifically focusing on inclusion, truth, and power. May our leaders of broader society also join us in this invitation. We look forward to your research in the areas that you've outlined, areas of privacy, which is in the technology field, issues of digital transformation, areas of urban farming technology. But given that we live in this extreme context every day, we really look forward to see how you weave that into operating in these extreme environments. So as I thank you, we encourage you to continue to disrupt the duality that many choose to live in and help us to reconcile some of these challenging contexts in which we live. I think you can give her yet another round of applause. <laughs> it now falls to me to thank all of those who work behind the scenes to make this inaugural lecture possible. I begin with you, our Vice Chancellor, uh, Professor Coupe, for the role you continue to play and you played this evening, and for being the function functionary for Professor Whitaker. I want to thank the members of the university as well as Gibbs executives who have joined us in person here on campus as well as online. I know there are many of you. I would like to thank members of our Gibbs faculty that's what we call academics here at Gibbs, because we think we are global <laughs> students. And of course, of alumni, uh, many of whom you have co-authored. I would like to thank visitors and friends and family of the Moffat and Whitaker family. Thank you for giving us such a beautiful colleague that we work with on a daily basis. You guys only get to experience her on weekends, evenings. We have the pleasure of experiencing her every day in a critical discourse manner, so to speak. <laughs> um, I would like to thank, uh, she's not here this today, but I saw her today, Ms. Tulusi Lembata from Professor Cooper's office for all the work that she does in the background in making Prof. Cooper look so professional, he, he doesn't do it on his own. <laughs> He's got a whole team that supports him, led by Mr. Tulisi Limbata. Of course, Mr. Uh, I don't know why it says Mr. because it's actually not, it's Miss Bernice Manike, uh, who coordinates the graduation ceremonies and inaugural addresses at UP. Uh, of course, um, the enigmatic, I think is outside, Wayne Mitchell, from Wayne Mitchell Photography, 
for capturing these memorable moments. Of course, he'll continue to do so this evening. Our video production team, you've seen some of them here. Uh, thank you, guys, and thanks for the wonderful work you do. In abstention, Ms. India Gonzalez for the editorial work that she does. And I don't see her right at the back. Ms. Teresa Paul, who heads up the faculty, faculty office in respect of all the administration and logistics, not only for this event, but for everything that happens at faculty. And finally, what we call our Gibbs ambassadors. Uh, you would have seen some of them. One of them is standing right at the back there, Harry. Um, the operations team, the duty managers, and the IT technicians. Much of what we do would not be possible without them. So I'd like to specifically acknowledge them and ask you to give them a round of applause, please. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we've come to the end of the formal part, which means some of us will derobe. We are wearing suits underneath this, uh, so don't, don't be frightened. And uh, we'll see you outside. If you may stand, please. Thank you. Thank you.